Okay, I'm just gonna get started. Hi everybody, my name is Chrissy Hodges. I'm the founder of, co-founder of OCD Peers. My co-founder, Melissa, or my uh, other partner will be here a little bit later to join us. I'm gonna keep an eye on um, everybody joining. This is gonna be recorded. If you don't want to be on camera, um, or if you don't want to be part of the recording, please feel free to turn your camera off. Um, just really quickly before we get started, we're really excited to have Michael here today. I know that everybody's going to have a lot of questions. Um, just wanted to tell you really quick, OCD Peers is a virtual uh, group practice for strictly peer support. We offer themed groups, catch-all groups. We do have a therapist that's also a peer, and she offers some skills building groups. Neil Hemmer, who's up there on the top, he's one of our peers. Brennan, who's in the middle, she's an assistant to OCD Game Changers. Michael Greenberg, we will introduce here in a moment. And then Chance McNeely is also a peer with OCD Peers. Um, we would love to encourage you to have your clients check us out. We run groups every single day. Um, and we run them for clients all around the world. Um, I want to, uh, I think Neil's gonna help moderate a little bit. Please make sure that your um, mute button is on. We're not gonna do any back and forth. We're just going to strictly do questions in the chat. I'm sure everybody knows what that is since we've had to do all of this for the last eight months. Um, and we're going to try to get through as many questions as possible. We'll, we'll start to wrap up five minutes till. Um, Neil and I will both be moderating the questions. And again, thank you for being here, y'all. Um, so really quickly, I just want to introduce Dr. Michael Greenberg. Um, Michael made a big splash on the, <laughs> on the scene when he had the OCD Stories podcast. There have been, there's been a lot of really awesome uh, things I know that we need to talk about and questions, clarifying questions you ask. And Michael, I just want to personally tell you, your work on rumination has been a game changer in my life as someone with OCD. And I just want to tell you how honored I am to have you here today um, and to just call you a colleague and friend. So with that, um, let's feel free to start getting your questions right now into the chat. We'll get started as soon as possible. Michael, do you want to quickly introduce yourself? Um, well, I think you did a good job. Hi, I'm Michael. <clears throat> I um, suffered with OCD for many years, as I said on the podcast, and so this is uh, just very, very personal to me. All right. Well, um, Neil, you're ready to go. I don't see any questions just yet, so y'all, y'all get, y'all get to ask him. <laughs> <laughs> Michael, is there anything you want to clarify that you've heard that people have had questions um, in particularly um, to get started? I'll just let people ask whatever, whatever they want to. I don't have to follow the chat, right? You'll no, 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 no. You just talk. Uh, Neil and I will, will be the ones that read the questions off. Um, so, Neil, I'll read the first one if we want to just kind of go back and forth. Um, Sounds good to okay. me. Great. Um, in the podcast, you talked about how your approach goes beyond inhibitory learning. Can you speak a little bit more specifically about how your clinic's approach to exposure differs? Okay. What are some of the specific interventions you use in prepping folks for exposure? Okay, so um, my, I'm not an expert on inhibitory learning, but my understanding is that inhibitory learning, and correct me if I'm wrong, my understanding is that inhibitory learning is basically saying, that a person is having a learning experience that goes against prior learning experiences. So it like disconfirms an expected outcome. So if you think about that broadly enough, then you could say that everything we're doing is inhibitory learning. And any time that somebody, like for example, if we said somebody thought that they would be anxious after they did an exposure and then we had them not ruminate and so they weren't anxious and so that is an experience that competes with their expectations, you could call everything inhibitory learning that we're doing. But I don't think that that's what people mean when they're talking about inhibitory learning. I think they're talking about you thought that if you touch that, maybe you would get sick and this showed you that you didn't get sick. That's my understanding of what inhibitory learning is. And so I think that my approach goes far further than that. Um, but if I have a wrong understanding of what inhibitory learning is, by all means, tell me. Does that, does that answer the question? So if this isn't just, and furthermore, I think inhibitory learning, I think is adding a, a different mechanism to how exposure works, but not necessarily exclusive to habituation. And we're saying that thinking in terms, or I'm saying that thinking in terms of habituation is actually, I think, wrong. I think it is actually nothing to do with how exposure works. I think that a person stops being anxious 
when they stop ruminating, not when they habituate, which is why sometimes people will continue to be anxious for days. It's not because they haven't habituated for days, it's because they continue to ruminate for days. And when they finally gave up on that, that's when they stopped being anxious. So I, I also think that thinking in terms of habituation guides people towards exposures that don't work. And so I think we're, I'm going further than inhibitory learning by saying that I'm talking exclusively about learning and not at, and not at all about habituation. Did that, did that answer the question? I know we're not talking back and forth, but whoever asked the question, could you say whether that answered it? Is, is that okay for me to, I know we're not supposed to do back and forth, is that okay? Yeah, I, I think that's, that's useful. I guess I'm wondering kind of about some of the specific mechanisms in terms of how you lead clients through exposures that is yeah. maybe a little bit different. And, and you're starting to kind of allude to some of those, those you, pieces. Could you give me a specific example so I can tell you what it would look like if I were doing it? Yeah, so like, um, for example, I will have clients, and, and your work on rumination has been so helpful. I send so many of my people your, your blog posts on, on rumination because uh, it's just so, so useful to get the conversation started. So I might have clients, for example, develop a list of thoughts that they tend to ruminate about, that tend to like make them want to uh, kind of latch on to whatever the problem is. And I will sometimes have them create like a recording of those thoughts or have a list of those thoughts that will just pop up on their phone and kind of mm -hmm. in, in an effort to kind of trigger that response, that urge to ruminate and ask them to not ruminate. Mm -hmm. Is there a different way and kind of how you describe that to, to folks? Yeah. So what you think through. So I do what you do. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that, how you do it would be determined by how you think exposure works. So for example, I would have people, not always, but when it's, you know, in certain cases where I think it's relevant, I would have people set alarms that pop up a thought so that they can learn that that thought can occur to them and that they can still make a choice to not engage with it. Especially for someone who doesn't want to be reminded of the thought, we want to make the point that that is not the issue. We can be reminded of the thought and we can still make a choice to not engage. So that would be an example of something I would do. When it comes to scripts or like recording like longer versions of that, I think that the only reason that that would work is if you believe in habituation. Other than taught, meaning there, there with one um, exception, I think there could be a value in talking about all the things that would have to happen in order for your worst fear to come true. But I wouldn't, frame that as exposure. I think that's cognitive. I think that's just talking through, like some getting some distance on the fact that even though ultimately what you're afraid of is the possibility of this coming true, it is highly unlikely, right? So I think that could have value, but I think that in terms of, I don't think that's exposure. And I think that in terms of, um, in terms of exposure, I would never record an imaginal script because I think the only reason to do that is habituation. Otherwise, I, I would just want a thought popping up, you're reminded of it, don't engage. I don't think there's added value in a script. And furthermore, I think that, I think it's unnecessary suffering and zero added value. And when you look at it that way, I think it's just not a good idea. So I never use scripts at all, ever. All right. Thank you. Yeah, okay. Uh, next question is, uh, how do you explain to clients the difference between stopping mental compulsions versus not engaging in thought suppression of obsessions? That's a great question. Um, a thought occurring to you, or even you're being aware of it. I use COVID actually a lot. That is my go-to example right now. We know it's COVID. It is not the same thing as sitting here trying to figure out what we're going to do, when it's going to end, how we're going to cope with it, planning, preparing, thinking about it. That doesn't mean it's not COVID. It's COVID. We know it's COVID, right? That question exists or that issue exists and we're not engaging with it. Does that, does that answer that question? Can we let the people who ask the question just, can we actually let them follow up and just confirm that I answered their question? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Th thank you, Michael. You, you definitely answered that. Super helpful. Um, just because sometimes when I'm talking with clients, there's a sense of like really wanting to be clear. It's like when an obsession pops up, we're not trying to suppress it or push it down. And yet there's something called a compulsion, which can certainly be mental yeah. compulsions that we treat very differently. So sometimes just yeah. like trying to, you know, walk that line very carefully. Yeah. Can, I, can I follow up actually? So it, this comes up especially with people who have sensory motor, where, where threading the needle between attention and awareness is like super crucial. 
I think that dialectically, as it were, we both need to be razor sharp about the distinction between attention and awareness. And we also need to hold that pretty lightly. Meaning you need to be clear on what the difference is, but you can't try to get that exactly right in your mind or, or you're just gonna be obsessing about that or compulsing about that. Does that make sense? So both, we need to be very clear on that distinction and you can't be extremely um, obsessive about getting that precise. Yes, does that make sense? Okay. Okay. Um, just want to say, by the way, like when everybody first came on, I just didn't get a chance to look at everybody. And I just want to say, so good to see all y'all. It's so good to see your faces. Um, I miss everybody. I'm dying. Uh, <laughs> so here we go. You mentioned in your writing that when shifting attention away from rumination should not require the client to think about anything else, but then you encourage them to think about literally anything else. Can you discuss this further? Yeah, that's a great question, um, which I think also might need some clarification in the articles. Um, in short, what I'm saying is it can be really helpful to get involved in something else, but it's not necessary in order to not direct attention towards something. So for example, if let's say somebody were, um, what's a good example? Trying to solve you. Yeah, let's say you're trying to solve a math problem. You don't need to direct your attention towards something else in order to stop solving a math problem. You also don't need to direct your attention towards something else in order to stop paying attention to something. All you need to do is let go of paying attention. In other words, it's not like we're constantly paying attention. This vector is always out, and we need to move that vector onto something else, right? We can just rescind it. We can just stop paying attention. And it is, and if somebody is, if somebody is trying to stop themselves from paying attention to this by paying attention to something else, using distraction as thought suppression, it's not going to work. And they're going to be working very hard. It's not going to work. They're going to continue to go back to what they were originally paying attention to, or they'll just pay attention to both. And it's going to make the process very hard. We want them to understand that what we're asking them to do is to not do something, to work less hard, to make less of an effort, to let go of paying attention. And once they understand that, it is also the case that it's much easier to do that if you go get involved in something else. Does that make sense? Whose question was that? Uh, that was mine. Did that answer the question? Yeah, when, it, when you discuss it, it sounds like it's, you're, you're asking people, it, it sounds like thought stopping and, and, and um, I, I thought suppression. It also seems like it creates a thought vacuum in a sense where it almost sounds like these, those two ideas, they need to happen together in the sense of if we're, divert, if we're diverting attention away from one thing to another thing, that that process needs to happen. If we're just saying, well, to stop doing the math problem, it's if we're stopping something, our brain is naturally going to present it with something else, something else to think about. And it's likely to be the thing that was bugging them in the first place. Right, so I think that this is, I think it's important in this context to again, distinguish between a thought being there versus analyzing it. We're not saying, I think what you're saying is that if you're not thinking of anything, you're going to be aware of something, right? But we're, I'm not talking about not being aware of something. I'm talking about not engaging with it. So for example, sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, I, yes, yes, I'm, I'm agreeing with you. Okay, so, um, so what we're saying is not that thought depression is only when you're trying to push something out of your awareness. I don't want to know that it's COVID, right? Like that, that doesn't, you can't do that because, and not for any fancy reason, but for the very obvious face valid reason that if you were try, if you were saying, I don't want to think about something, you are literally thinking about it in the process of nothing, right? That's obvious. So we're not, that's thought suppression. If I said, I, I don't want to know it's COVID right now, that's thought suppression, but it is COVID, but I'm not going to sit here engaging with that or thinking about that, right? That's not thought suppression. I'm aware of it. I'm just not engaging. You look like this is not landing. Agreed. I, 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 I follow what you're saying. Sorry, I got distracted by a text from the missus. Oh, okay. No, that's fine. That's fine. I just, I thought maybe I wasn't answering your question. No, no, no. So, um, so what, we're, what I'm saying is that in order to not engage with thinking about COVID, you don't need to go start planning your vacation. It's not like you need to actively direct your attention towards something else in order to not be ruminating about COVID. That's not necessary. You that's just need to sit there. Helpful. 
I can, yeah, I can sit here and not think about COVID, right? And just not ruminate about anything. It's not like we're constantly ruminating about something. We don't always have to be analyzing. And at the same time, if I don't want to be thinking about COVID, it might be helpful to make a decision to not think about it and now go get engaged with the rest of my life. Okay. Does that make sense? But COVID's still going to be there. If I look up, it's still there. Still there. Or the, or the fact that I don't know if I'm a pedophile or the fact that I don't know if I'm gay or whatever it is. It's still there, but I'm just not engaging with it. Right. Okay. All right. So the next question, um, I, I think I'm going to butcher this person's last name, but it's Elliot Kamansky, and they want to know, what are your plans to collect data, make a manual, and have it researched? And am I your favorite therapist friend? Okay, so that I'll answer the easy question first. Okay. Yeah, obviously you are. And so, so, so here's the reality. The reality is that um, I have about 100 pages of other stuff that I want to write, and it's a priority for me to get those ideas out there before I start testing the, this methodology. Um, and that could be right or wrong of me to have those priorities, but those are my priorities. Um, and so it's gonna be a while. If somebody else wants to run with it, you know, God bless, I'll help you. But I'm not gonna be, I'm focusing on um, getting ideas out that are important to me and that I think need to be shared. Um, and I struggle to find time for that. Um, but I do ultimately hope to, to finish writing and then to, to do some research. Elliot, you're one of my favorite therapist friends too. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that's what I'm going for. Thanks, okay. thanks for that. <laughs> Can you elaborate on your position that effective exposures need to be free of anxiety? Good question. Yeah. So, okay. So here, here's a theoretical framework for this that I've been thinking about recently. It's not fully baked, but we can try it on for size. People with OCD have basically two layers of fear. One is the core fear, whatever they're actually afraid of, right? And then there's also the fear of the anxiety itself. So if, I don't know how many people here have OCD. I assume plenty. Um, but basically, if you have OCD, you're navigating your life constantly afraid of falling into that abyss of anxiety, right? Like I remember thinking, I, I never wanted to plan a trip because I like, who knows, I could wake up in, you know, wherever I traveled to and just be having a horrendous day. And like, why, like, you just never know what you're going to get. So that's the fear of the anxiety itself. So there's the core fear and there's the fear of the OCD itself. You can address the fear of the OCD itself by teaching a person that if they rein in the rumination, they can rein in the anxiety. And so we treat the fear of the anxiety itself with teaching response prevention of compulsive rumination. If we do an exposure to something that makes somebody anxious and, and they learn that they can do that thing, but they continue to be anxious, then we might have disconfirmed their fear of what would happen if they did that. And we might even have shown them that they can do that, but we've also shown them that they'll continue to feel anxious if they do it. So for example, let's say, Let's say we have a, a, a parent who is afraid of molesting their kid. And so we do an exposure to changing a diaper. So, okay, great. So they learn that they can change the diaper despite being miserable while they do it. But what I really want them to, to find out is that they can change the diaper and not be miserable when they do it. That they can change the diaper and not feel anxious or at least not feel, eliminate most of their anxiety, eliminate the, the anxiety that just goes on and on. And so if we do the exposure, if we have the person change the diaper without addressing rumination, they're going to be changing the diaper, they're going to be anxious, right? It's going to be a terrible experience. And on the one hand, they'll learn that they can do it, even though they're scared. But on the other hand, they're learning that it's a terrible experience. And so if we teach them to do that in the context of not ruminating, that is a much more freeing experience. Then they learn that they can change the diaper and it's not a miserable experience as long as they rein in the rumination. Does that answer the question? Yeah, I took what you were saying to mean that they shouldn't have any anxiety like while it's occurring and leading up to it. And um, so I, I think I would think of it as um, 
like asymptotic. Like we're trying, we're, we're minimizing anxiety as much as possible. Is the person not going to have even a moment of like a discomfort? I'm not saying that. Right. But we want to keep, we want, by not ruminating, we can keep it as close to zero as possible. And we're, we're aiming for zero. Aiming for zero doesn't mean we're going to get to zero. But if somebody, if I'm doing an exposure like that, and I say, how anxious are you? And they say like a three, they're ruminating. Just, just based on experience, they're ruminating. If they say it's like a zero one, if they say it's like a one, I'm like a little, but I'm not engaging, then I'm not going to be, then I, then I don't think necessarily they're ruminating. But if it's getting off the ground more than like a teeny tiny layer of discomfort, they're probably ruminating. They're probably thinking. Mm -hmm. So when you're doing an exposure for the very first time with somebody for like, let's say, um, locks, like checking locks, you want their uh, suds to be at a, under like a three. I, yeah, I want, I would, I want them to, I, we're going to not check the lock and we're going to not ruminate about it. Does that mm -hmm. make sense? So we're going to not check the, I mean, this is, assuming that this, that this is not really that scary during the session, right? Because it's probably only scary to leave the lock open if I go to sleep, right? So I would, before we did this exposure, I, we start with response prevention of rumination. So we would already have gotten them extremely good at, at response prevention of rumination. And mm -hmm. only then would we, would we make the decision to leave the lock and not check it, and then go to sleep and not ruminate about it, and find out that if you don't ruminate about it, you don't lie in bed worrying about the lock being open. Does that make sense? Yes. So, okay. So, so we start, so before we got to that exposure, we would have started with rumination. This person would already be expert at reining that in. And then we would do the exposure in the context of not ruminating. Right. Cause otherwise this person might learn, yeah, I can leave the lock open, but then I lie in bed and I can't sleep because I'm so anxious. All right. Your next question is, uh, when you're doing the rumination stopping practice in session, what are you doing during the minute of not ruminating after the 30 seconds of ruminating? Small talk, distraction, just sitting there. Whatever, whatever feels like it makes sense. Like pr probably not, not doing anything that's distracting on purpose, but like maybe it's, uh, if this is a person, if this is a person who tends to use distraction, then they might need to really sit there and do nothing and learn that they cannot do anything. If this is a person who's not like that and they want to like do something else or go on their phone, I don't, then I don't care. It depends on the person. If this is a person who is constantly ruminating while they're, you know, I don't know, reading, then maybe they, maybe they'd read. It depends on the context. Most of the time, probably doing nothing. Um, but it if there's a reason to do something else, then we might do something else, like in the context of the case. Does that make sense? That was like a non-answer. Yeah, probably nothing, but sometimes something. That, that was my question. And uh, no, I think you, you answered it. Part of the reason I asked is because what I picture with someone at home is what you're going to do when you're not ruminating is whatever the next right thing in your life is to do. It might be wash a dish or like, you know, water a plant. But mm -hmm. in session, like it's to me, it oh. feels harder to construct yeah. what that minute yeah. is. So actually, so actually, I'm glad you asked that. So I would not say that. I, and I think that what I want them to do when they're not ruminating is I don't care. They don't need to go, the valued, valued actions, right? Like act stuff, I think as people know and don't like, I hate act, like, like I literally just the word makes me shake. I think it is like horrible. I think it makes people sick. And so value, I do, I do not think that you need to do valued actions in order to not do a compulsion. You do not need to be an especially good person or even an especially, you know, values driven person to not have OCD. You can do whatever the hell you want. You can go watch porn. You just can't ruminate. Thank you. Very helpful. Thank you. All right. Um, so how is not engaging in a thought different than avoiding it or suppressing it? Great question. Um, COVID, right? The, the, did, did this person, whoever asked this question, did the COVID example already answer it or do you want me to address it again? So I think my struggle where I'm, I guess where I'm struggling and it relates to my second question as well is like, I hear completely what you're saying, which is that like, we can't do exposures if patients are ruminating, right? We know that that's really exposures without response prevention. And so I think I'm struggling with 
how not engaging in rumination is any different than traditional ERP because it's it's really right the goal of ERP whether you're doing an outward compulsion or rumination like you have to stop that in order for it to be successful but early on I heard you speak a little bit about you know it's really about just kind of like the thoughts they are not engaging in at all right where traditional ERP we actually want to engage with the thought and encourage you not to engage in your response so that we can change the relationship with the behavior and I worry that patients could turn this into avoidance, right? Of like, let me push it down, let me suppress it. And, and that just allows it to continue to be there. Okay, so there were like three different questions. Sorry. In there. No, no, that's okay, but I want to take them one at a time. And if I miss any of them, what, like tell me. Okay. So um, let me just pin it, one, two, three, okay. So even though we can like, put this in, we can say, oh, of course, we always knew that we shouldn't do compulsions during exposures. And of course, rumination is a compulsion. And we can like retroject that onto how ERP was designed. The reality is that rumination was not recognized as a compulsion and that the how much rumination, how what I mean by rumination, any mental engagement was absolutely not something that the people who designed ERP were thinking about. They might have gotten that there were certain mental compulsions that were going on, like very discreet phenomena, like try, like somebody actively trying to undo it, but they weren't thinking in terms of like just the fact that you're engaged with it at all, right? So that's number one. I think that thinking about the original classical model of ERP in terms of this construct of rumination that we're talking about, I think is a little bit anachronistic. So I think that we can rethink ERP in terms of rumination, but I don't think it's the case that this was on the radar, uh, at least this, I, this conceptualization of rumination was on the radar of the people who were designing it originally. That's first of all. So second of all, let me just remember what we we're talking about. Oh, um, if you assume that the point of exposure is habituation, then the reason that you can't do compulsions is because they interfere with the habituation. That means that response prevention facilitates the exposure, but the mechanism of action is the habituation. The way that I think not just I'm thinking about exposure, but the field is moving towards thinking about exposure, and especially in terms of inhibitory learning, is that habituation if habituation is out of the picture, it's no longer the case that response prevention facilitates exposure. It's actually the case that exposure facilitates response prevention. In other words, when you take habituation out of the picture, the only reason you're doing an exposure is so the person can learn to do response prevention. Does that make sense? It's, it sounds like it's only subtly different. It's actually completely different and it radically changes how you do the exposure. So this is where imaginal scripts are the best example of this. An imaginal script only makes sense if you're thinking in terms of habituation. If the only point of an exposure is to not do a compulsion, then all you need is enough to make the person anxious and then practice not doing the compulsion. And so an imaginal script has nothing over just a reminder of the thought. Does that make sense? You look like this is not, like I'm not answering your question. So go ahead. No, no, you're answering it. I follow totally. I think, I think I struggle more with the thought process that rumination wasn't a big piece of original ERP and the constructs that most of our clinics like focus on. And, and I think my second piece, I'm just still struggling with candidly as someone who's also lived with OCD for many years is the concept of like, like, I guess I, I would really be curious to ask you. So like, there's never been exposures that you've done that are effective that raised your anxiety above a one. And like, so I'm just, I'm struggling with that fundamentally because I can't totally okay. compartmentalize. Yeah, it. okay, so, so two separate questions. So I'm gonna answer the second one first. The question isn't whether the exposure was effective. The question is, how is it effective? So for example, if I'm somebody who's scared of, let's use the diaper example again. If I'm somebody who is terrified, I feel like I cannot change the diaper because I'm so scared, and I do the exposure, and I'm at a 10 the whole time, right? Is that exposure effective? Partially. It is partially effective. If I previously didn't think that I could change a diaper, and now I can change a diaper, we have freed me up tremendously, right? Now I can change diapers. So it was effective. 
but I think that it, I think that it could be more effective or differently effective or teach something more or get a person even better if we did that in, in the context of not ruminating. Then it would be not only that you can change the diaper, but you can do it and not be freaked out the whole time. Totally. And, but, but I mean, I think that's where I, yeah, totally. I, I completely agree. But I think that's, that's how I've always viewed ERP, right? Is that if mm -hmm. somebody's anxiety stays high, I agree. Like that's usually an indicator for me of like, we're doing something wrong. Like the exposure isn't working if your anxiety is still a 10 the whole time, because you're probably doing some type of mental ritual. I'm assuming that what you mean is if it's a 10 the whole time meeting, if it doesn't come down in a curve the way I, I'm assuming you were trained like I was trained which is that we expect it to be high at the beginning and then the more you keep on doing it, the more it comes down because you're getting used to it. Is that how you were trained to yeah, think? And, and I think I focus a ton, um, you know, Chrissy and lots of people's work on mental rituals, I think has really brought to light. Like I focus so much on rumination mm -hmm. and mental rituals because as someone who lives with OCD, we know how much it plays a role in. Mm -hmm. So I think that you, it might be the case that you intuitively and based on your own personal experience, like me, sort of came to similar conclusions and incorporated it into your work. That's not the same thing as saying that the original. That like, everyone was trained that way. Sure. Yeah, that's okay. not actually, I appreciate that. Like if you look at the actual, I have the manual from Penn on my shelf. And like, that's not actually, it doesn't talk about it. I think you just got in there on your own is my guess. Hmm. Is that, yeah? So just for the sake of time, um, we, we, we are gonna come back to the second question down below, uh, Dr. McIntyre, but we're gonna move on to the next question. Cause... We're good with all of them, thank you. They were all addressed. Cool, okay. All right, your next question, sir, is can you talk about your concern with externalizing anxiety? especially with kids, if the child understands that their character is the initial obsession and not the continuation of the thoughts, does that resolve the concern about using an externalization character? Mm -hmm. Therefore, the child would still have a sense of agency over the choice to engage with the worry character thought. Okay. Um, first of all, I think the answer, broadly speaking, is yes. I think that that would address the concern. Um, I don't, this is, you know, I have a pretty hard line on ACT. I don't have such a hard line on this. I don't like externalizing. I don't like a lot of the ways that people externalize, but I don't, I don't think it's like the most devastating thing in the world if you teach a seven-year-old about a worry monster. Does that make sense? I don't think, I think that it misses an opportunity to normalize certain things. I think it misses an opportunity to, um, to teach certain things and to restore even more agency. I don't think we're necessarily making somebody sick by doing this though. But I, I think that it depends how it's done. And I'm sure that nobody here is doing it in a really you know, misguided way, but there are some people who are like, <laughs> like I, let's say for example, I, I'd like they, they sort of take, this is I think some, they, they take like an, ex, an uncomfortable experience that somebody is having and they just chalk it up to its OCD, as opposed to like, no, that's an experience you're having. Does that make sense? Like, or that's a worry that you have. Or I, I want to use, let's say, for example, let's use groinal responses as a, as a really good example of this. As somebody who has had groinal responses, I'm sure many people here, Chrissy's had groinal, well, groinal responses. Okay, so we could say, oh, this is your OCD, right? Your OCD is causing you to have a groinal response, which by the way, like for all that we might want that to make somebody feel better, it doesn't really, because they're like, but what if it's not, right? Okay, so what if we said, this is just a human experience. People have feelings of arousal or feeling down there that is, you know, uncomfortable or things, something that doesn't match how they like to think about their sexual orientation or whatever, right? Or that's directed towards somebody you don't want it to be directed towards whatever. And like, that's an unfortunate part of, be that's an uncomfortable part of being human. And your job is to not get stuck analyzing that, right? That's an example of something where I think so many of us are like, oh, it's the OCD. And I just think it's unnecessary. And I think it could actually be uh, less, more, more destigmatizing and normalizing and validating to, to say that lots of people have that. You know, it's not your OCD that's me. Here's another good example, relationship OCD, right? We could say, oh, it's just your OCD that's making you have, you know, these doubts about your relationship. Or we could normalize that you're ambivalent like everybody else, like that you have ambivalent. This is where the psychoanalytic community really has, I mean, honestly, one of the million places where they have some advantages over our training. Like 
they assume that we're always ambivalent. And if we're not ambivalent, it just means the ambivalence is unconscious. Of course you both love and hate your partner. Of course there's a part of you that, that loves them and a part of you that's a little disappointed sometimes. Of course. And we don't have to call that OCD. We can normalize that. It's just the human experience. Do you know what I mean? So I think those are all example. I, so again, I don't have such a hard line against externalization, but I think that it misses a lot of opportunities and I don't think it adds anything. I think it's unnecessary. Does, yeah, whoever, I don't know whose question it was, but did that answer thank, the question? Thank you, I appreciate that. We're gonna talk more about this next month when you and I talk. Because oh, it's you, hey, how's it going? <laughs> that, that gives me some things to think about too. I think some of that is what I already do, um, but but thinking about all of your the stuff you're teaching in terms of teaching it to kids has been something I've been thinking a lot about because kids have a harder time with these abstract ideas of, that I love of yours, but I'm trying to make sense of how mm -hmm. to help a child understand these things. Yeah. So yeah. thank you for answering that. Yeah, of course. Okay, next question. I'd love to hear other tangible examples besides the math problem. I think, and my patients have mentioned, that many people would continue to mentally solve the math problem even if they weren't looking at it. I do like the example of the text dinging and not even looking at the message. Okay, so the question was just like, can I give other metaphors? Is that it? Yeah? <laughs> I can clarify it with my question. So basically, I mean, you use that as an example a lot and you're right in some of the things that I've read on your, you know, your articles on your site. And when, and when talking about it with patients, like they also are like, well, that's not just as simple as putting down the pencil and paper and that you're not standing actually writing on it you know and so I guess I'm wondering whether you've had success with other like examples or metaphors that that genuinely that like work in most all situations mm -hmm. I think what you're saying is um, th that these people are saying well that's different because it's physical that you could physically put down the pencil whereas this is mental is that the issue no, I'm saying that people would, I have, I mean, certainly mathematicians, but also like some of my regular patients, they would continue mentally solving the math problem, even if they walked away from it. So, because using that as the example of like, if I asked you to stop, you know, uh, solving the math problem, then you would just stop solving it. And I guess that's, that's mm -hmm. where I'm, I mean, I understand like if you mm -hmm. stopped walking on the treadmill, but that's not a mental behavior like I'm wondering if there's other mental behaviors that you have examples of that we can easily kind of stop just like you're saying that we could stop ruminating so the um the thing that jumps out at me from what you're saying is the word would that they would keep solving the math problem I'm saying that they could stop solving the math problem I'm telling them that even if it doesn't feel like they could like they can stop they can stop that's just how brains work like, it's just not true. Just like I, I, I sometimes talk about picking your nose. Like, it might feel like you can't stop picking your nose because you've been doing it for years, but can you take your finger, and it might be very automatic and it might end up in there, but can you take your finger out of your nose? Just yes, yes you can. You can take your finger out of your nose and you can also stop solving a math problem. The fact that you might not do that, you know, that's what we have to sort out in therapy, why you're doing it, why you're not making the decision to stop, why you're scared. But it doesn't change the fact that just how brains work is that you can stop solving a math problem, period. Does that make sense? I would just okay, add to that. Yeah, so I mean, yeah. focusing more on agency, which is, I think, yeah. what, yeah. what I've been yeah. trying to do. Okay. Also helping them to realize that what they're doing is analytical thinking, which again, as somebody who's dealt with this, you don't always realize that's what's going on. I, I would add to that that it's not always analytical thinking, and this is something I need to clean up in my writing. Um, and that is that there is, I think, a, spect a continuum from awareness, attention, analysis, I think is how I'm thinking about it now. There is this sort of in-between space where like you're paying attention to the problem. And granted, I would argue you're still trying to solve it, but you haven't, you're not literally sitting there thinking through the things. You're just kind of keeping an eye on it, right? And 
just like I would tell them, analytical thinking, actually you do have control of, well, to control over it. I would say the same thing about attention. You think you don't have control over it, but yes, you do. That's how brains work. Yeah, does that answer? The reality is I probably use infinite metaphors. I just cycle through them, like just anything. You're planning, you know, you're making your shopping list, stop making your shopping list. You're planning your vacation. You're thinking of a, like for visuals, right? Because people think that visual, people think that, that anybody who says I'm having this very vivid image or this like this whole scene pop into my mind. No, you're not. That's not how that works. You can't do that without trying, right? The most, so I'll tell them, try to imagine we're going to sit here and you're not going to actively imagine a very attractive person, but we're just going to see if a very attractive person occurs to you. And they find out that unless they literally sit there, like actively thinking about a very attractive person, the most that can occur to them is a very vague peripheral image, not even image, right? So I think I use all sorts of examples, just depending on what, who that person is and what's going on. But all of them would just get at this idea that a lot of what's going on is something you're doing, not just something occurring to you. Is that, yeah? Dr. Greenberg, I love how you were like, yes, you can stop your attention. That's how brains work. <laughs> That's yeah. just, but it's true, but people don't know that. You know, <laughs> we've spent, we spent decades as a field. I, the, here's the saddest thing. This is, and this is honestly devastating. Like I, I, am, I like feel emotional talking about it. If we hadn't taught people about thought suppression for decades and, and given them wrong ideas about exposure and habituation for decades, people would be less sick than they are now. I, I, I hear from probably 10 to 20 people a day, and I try to talk to everybody, even if they're not coming to the practice. And a lot of the people I speak to are sicker because of what they think you're supposed to do for exposure. For example, like just a guy from, from a couple of weeks ago, this is a guy who's afraid that he's you know, attracted to animals. And so, what, so he's actively doing exposure all the time. And what he thinks that means is he's actively thinking about it all the time. And he's afraid to do thought suppression, right? This is a person who left to his own devices without the internet and without any guidance, would just kind of walk around scared that he's attracted to animals. But instead, he is suffering. He is spending all day thinking about it, trying to be attracted to animals, looking, checking. I mean, he doesn't realize he's checking, right? This is a person who would be better off if he were in 1800 than if he lived in 2020 with all of the things that our field has said about how this works. And that's really, really upsetting. So just so we all know, um, we have 15 minutes left. This is our 15 minute warning. Um, so if everybody wants to get like their last thoughts and questions and now we'll keep going down the list. Um, just so I make sure, Dr. McInville, your second question is here, but you're all good. Okay, cool. Um, all right, so moving on. This is a reply to something you said earlier. Um, investigating justification for rumination. How do you respond to, if I don't ruminate, I get very anxious and I'm not sure I want to break free. My OCD tells me I don't want to be better. Well, I, th I think that, um, I mean, I'm not gonna address what my OCD tells me because that's its own like issue, right? What that person is saying is they are ambivalent, right? They are conflicted, they are scared, right? Yes, but, yes. Who's talking? Tammy. Oh, hey. <laughs> <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't see who it was. Okay. Um, um, okay. So um, I think that addressing justifications for OCD is actually the crux of the treatment, right? People think that I am saying, oh, you teach somebody how to not ruminate and then their OCD is all better. Like, no, <laughs> that's, that's teaching somebody how to not do one compulsion and then there's an entire case, right? Sometimes that is really everything and they get better really fast. But I think that what takes up the most time is actually the justification. Mm -hmm. And this is where I get, you know, don't stone me, super psychodynamic. Not only do I want to understand, um, sometimes I think about um, justifications in, in two, sort of two categories. And again, this is just conceptual. I don't know if I'll feel this way in a few months. There's like, there's like two dimensional justifications, which is literally, I think I need to, the way I need to figure out my sexual orientation and the way to figure it out is to sit here ruminating, right? So what's the justification? I need to figure this out or I'm going to marry the wrong person, right? 
that's like a pretty straightforward justification. But then I think there are three dimensional justifications or more psychodynamic. And by psychodynamic for the, for the uninitiated, all we mean is that like, how are emotions moving around? How does thinking something or not thinking something protect me from a feeling or what does it mean, et cetera. So it's more three dimensional. So using HOCD as an example, we could have somebody who is afraid, who is using rumination to, to block themselves from feeling something, right? The second they see a, you know, a person of the same sex, they're, they're like doing something to neutralize it, right? And they are terrified that if they don't do that, they will allow themselves to feel something and that they will then be able, they will never be able to take that back. It'll be a stain on their record. Or they're afraid that they will discover that they're gay, right? They're afraid that if they don't rein it in, they will discover that they're gay um, or that they'll, whatever. Th those are two good examples. So there, the justification isn't just this like rational two-dimensional, I need to figure out my sexual orientation. It's actually, it's actually serving a defensive purpose. It's, I mean, it's always defensive, but it's actually neutralizing another feeling. Or for example, when I feel, let's forget sexual orientation. Let's say somebody who is, um, they, whenever they get angry or they, they turn it against the self, right? So the rumination is really figuring out how it's their fault and they're afraid that otherwise they will, I don't know. That's not a good example. Give me one second. What's a good example of a dynamic justification? Rela emotional ruining, relationship OCD. If I allow myself to just not feel in love right now, to just not feel attracted right now, I'm somehow like, I, I will lose it. It will never come back. I need to hold on to it by ruminating, right? I can't just let it be there, mm -hmm. right? Um, so, so in my practice, we integrate short-term dynamic conceptualization with ERP. And so this justification piece takes up a lot of space. Why are you doing this? What are you afraid of? Where did this come from, right? Um, and so I have no idea what your original question was because I got lost, but to how, how, did, this, did this happen to answer what you asked? Uh, yes, it answered. Uh, I, I think since listening to your uh, podcast, I, so if a client would say to me, um, I don't, I don't want to stop ruminating because I get really anxious, then what I used to say is, oh, good. There's your anxiety. Good. You want mm -hmm. that anxiety. And so now having listened to your uh, interview, I'm like, oh, wow, this is very different because now you're saying, well, if you're anxious, you're, ru you're ruminating. And then when somebody says to me, but I don't want to stop ruminating because that's when I do get anxious. I just wondered how you would respond yeah. to that. Okay. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. So I think I would first of all want to clarify with this person, whether they mean that they're scared not to ruminate. Right. And like, what, what does that mean? Are they saying that they're afraid to just walk away from the question of whether they're a pedophile? right, that's terrifying to just walk away from that question, then what if they do something, right? Do they mean that they're actually anxious or do they mean that they're scared of the consequence of not doing that? If somebody says they stopped ruminating but they're still really anxious, I, I would kind of help them to realize that that's not happening. They are ruminating, right? They, they are, it might be a different form of rumination. It might be now they're ruminating about the fact that they're not ruminating, or maybe now they're, what, now they're ruminating about what might happen if they don't realize they're a pedophile. They're ruminating. So I would clarify whether they mean that they're prospectively scared uh, to let it go, or whether they mean that empirically, functionally, when they stop ruminating, they're still anxious, in which case I would help them to figure out how they're still ruminating, how they're still engaging with the question. Yeah? Okay. Okay, we're getting to seven minutes. I just want everyone to know seven minutes. So uh, I, okay, making sure that the client is an expert in at reigning in rumination. Can you explain more about that process? Yeah. Um, okay, okay, I need more specific. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I'm multitasking and trying to type and listen at the same time is not my strong suit, so I just made it really brief. Um, I'm wondering kind of specifically, 
Mm-hmm. You mentioned something very interesting, which is that you don't actually encourage someone to go do an exposure, like leaving the door unlocked until you have gotten them to be really an expert and you've kind of trained them and coached them through. Can you say more about how you do that and kind of where do you start yes, with your yes. clients? Mm-hmm. <clears throat> yeah. We start every case with response prevention. We do like intake, case formulation, case conceptualization, what's the core fear? That's like one first session, maybe second session. And then next step is not exposure. Next step is response prevention. We want this person to know, oh, my computer's gonna die, one second. I feel like I should talk or something while this is going on. I'm just, I'm just getting closer to my plug. Okay, we're good. Um, then next step is response prevention. Okay. Um, so I have an article on the website that's, that's called, um, ERP exercises for compulsive rumination. So we usually do, we usually use those. Um, and then we assign response prevention of rumination during the week. So your homework probably the first week is to eliminate rumination. Does that make sense? Um, and then to come in with any stuck points, any, any places where it was a problem or any places where you got stuck, we troubleshoot those and we get you to a point where you know how to not ruminate and you are largely eliminating rumination. Like we are coming in and you're saying like maybe grand total a few minutes a day, but like there are no significant periods. Only then do we start doing exposure. I, I should be clear, it's not quite that, um, it's not quite that boundaried, meaning if there are certain things that a person is ready to just let go of without ruminating, then they can start eliminating those. We're not going to say like, no, no, don't, you know, don't eliminate that compulsion until you're ready. But we don't start exposure in earnest. I think that's the better way to say it. We don't start like hardcore doing the things that are really terrifying for you until this person knows how to not ruminate. And I will add that when you eliminate rumination, 95% of the problem is gone before you start exposure. The person is almost better and exposure is like one, two. Because it's easy. It's not scary to let it go when you're not scared of the anxiety itself. Does that make sense? Not in all cases, you know, infinite, there are infinite um, you know, nuances and variations, but broadly speaking, when you start with response prevention, you, you, you get rid of most of the problem before you even start the actual exposures. Yeah, I would agree. This is actually remarkably similar to my approach as well. So helpful. Boom. Cool. Thanks. I think we probably have time for one question, and, and it's really, really important, I think, that we get to this question. Sorry, Neil, I just jumped all over your toes, because I know you're supposed to be next. But I know we have a few minutes left, but I really, really, the next two questions in a row, I really want you to be able to have the opportunity to answer this. I'm curious about your statement that ACT makes people sick. Perhaps I'm misunderstanding how you view ACT as detrimental. And the next uh, question as well addresses that. And um, I think this is going to be where we do end after this question. Um, and so just want to give you the opportunity to mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, um, so basically, I got, I got an email from somebody. Um, actually, Chrissy, you were CC'd on the email. I got an email from somebody a couple of weeks ago that I thought framed this really well. They said, I was at first really put off by what you said about ACT because ACT had really been helpful to me in getting past where classical ERP had taken me. In other words, classical ERP helped me get rid of my physical compulsions, but then I had nothing to do with my rumination, and so ACT helped me with that. And they said, how much time, can I, do I have time to look up the email and, and read the actual thing that they wrote? Do I have- Why don't seconds? you keep talking and I'll look it up. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Okay. Um, Basically, ACT can help a person, but it also keeps them sick. In other words, it might get them better than where they were with just classical ERP. But then I once did a survey of about, I think, 10 people responded, ACT providers, on the OCD specialist forum. And not a single one of them helped a person to distinguish between a thought occurring to you and compulsive rumination. And when we tell people that they... um, shouldn't try to get rid of these thoughts, we are literally telling them that they, should, that they shouldn't do anything about the rumination. Now, could you, and there's an article on my website that is very nuanced about this, so feel free to check it if you haven't for the details. Could you be an ACT provider 
who is using ACT principles in a way that really helps her patients and doesn't make them sick, and you're only using ACT for just the existence of the question, like COVID, and you're only using it in a way that works, yes, that could exist. But the majority of ACT providers are not doing that. And the, and the ACT resources, any book that people read, is not doing that. It is not nuanced. It is not sorting out rumination from a thought occurring to you. And it is ultimately telling people to do a lot of things that actually prevent them from, from getting better. Okay. Chrissy, if you have the email, that email said it better than I could ever say it. So um, he says, my therapist taught me how to do response prevention, but despite nailing physical compulsion, she never adequately taught me how to deal with mental compulsions. By meditating, I've become adept at noticing what my mind is doing, but I've been using the skill to spot the mental compulsions and then use the diffusion techniques from ACT that she taught me. In effect, I've spent the last two years almost recovered, getting good at observing myself, ruminating. Then I heard your podcast with Stuart. It's changed everything. Whilst, yes, he's from the UK. I was recovered. I was also having to learn to accept that the OCD would always be there just around the corner and I had no control. But your approach, I believe, has hit the nail 100% on the head. The vast majority of mental activity associated with my OCD theme is actually rumination over which I have far, far more control than I ever realized. The automatic thought is a much smaller component than I realized. This has been incredibly liberating. And in just the past three weeks, I've been applying your advice and I've seen improvements. And he, he also said, I, I, don't, I don't know if it was in what you just said. He said when he initially heard what I said about ACT, he was really upset because ACT had helped him so much. Yes, but he said, I have to say that your comments on ACT landed very badly when I heard the podcast, but that is because I've spent two years becoming adept at using ACT for my rumination. I believe ACT has its place in some mental health conditions, but clearly not for us non-observable ritualizers. Yeah, so in other words, if you were previously freaking out every time you were ruminating and ACT helped you to calm down while you were ruminating, right, and to, to make your peace with it, it helps you a little bit, but it's also keeping you from getting all the way better because it's telling you not to fight that. So the same thing that's making you a little bit better is keeping you from getting all the way better because it's telling you to make your peace with the fact that you're doing this compulsion all the time. And again, could you use ACT principles to do this in a nuanced way? Yeah, you absolutely could. But you're gonna be confusing people because you're introducing them to this world of ACT that has a lot of wrong ideas and a lot of like, or for example, telling people that they should use mindfulness for rumination is misguided for, for 1000 reasons. I'll refer you to my article that goes into great detail, but you don't need to do mindfulness to not ruminate. And I would add, you need to not ruminate all the time, but you cannot do mindfulness all the time. And I would add, telling somebody that they need to do mindfulness in order to not ruminate is, is totally misleading because it makes them think that the opposite of ruminating is doing something else. It's like telling somebody they have to do mindfulness in order to not wash their hands. You don't need to do mindfulness in order to not wash your hands. So I think ACT is, is like, I think ACT is like really, really problematic, even though it helps people. So it's not surprising to me that there are studies that say that ACT helps, because if the definition of helps is gets, I mean, first of all, I would wonder what the outcome measures are, like what it means that it helps. If it means that a person is less distressed by their rumination, it makes sense to me that it helps but it's still not actually solving the problem. And in fact, it is probably maintaining the problem. It is probably telling a person that they can't get better and that this is what it is and that they should just make their peace with it. Okay, Michael, Dr. Michael Greenberg, thank you for being here today, for answering some of these clarifying questions. We, we do have several more questions and what I might do, Michael, is just forward those questions to you um, email wise and we can send them out or we can talk about that. Um, any final thoughts or any final words? Uh, thank you all for coming. I appreciate it. Um, yeah, I hope we can do this again. Yeah. And thank you so much for being here, everyone. And I'm glad that you got introduced to our platform, OCD Peers. So if you have questions for us about what OCD Peers is, please reach out to me over the email that I sent this uh, invitation out. Um, and just really appreciate all that you do here for our community. Thank you so much for taking the time to be here. Thanks, Christy.